Welcome to an Overdrive edition of the Russian Rulers History Podcast. This is a continuation of the series from the book Khrushchev Remembers. And this has to do with the relationship or the deteriorating relationship between Moscow and Beijing, especially with Mao Zedong. Uh, we're going to go through the second visit to Peking, the Formosa Strait Crisis, the third visit to Peking, the Great Leap Forward, and the border dispute before we wrap this up. Uh, this will be the last of the readings from this particular section of Khrushchev Remembers. Uh, the next episode, regular one, will be episode 101, where we'll be seeing Khrushchev being overthrown by people like Gromyko and Brezhnev. And then we're going to have a final reading from this book, and that will be having to do with agriculture and how Khrushchev, it's probably the only time Khrushchev actually talks about uh, what the people who took over from him were doing and what he sees as their problems, especially this agricultural issue, which really haunts Russia and uh, the Soviet Union and had for so many centuries. So let's begin. This is the second visit to Peking. Once we began to produce diesel and nuclear-powered submarines, our Navy suggested that we request of the Chinese government permission to build a radio station in China so that we could maintain communications with our submarine fleet operating in the Pacific. We discussed the matter in leadership and decided to make a formal proposal to the Chinese. We considered the idea to be as much in China's interests as it was in our own. After all, we shared with the Chinese the common goal of protecting the socialist countries against the imperialists. Besides, we'd willingly complied with Mao's request that we help them build submarines. As far as I remember, we let the Chinese have our designs and sent our experts to help them choose a place in which to build the submarines. Therefore, we fully expected the Chinese to cooperate with us when we asked for a radio station on their territory. As it turned out, though, the Chinese were anything but cooperative. They, their reaction was stormy and irate. When our ambassador in Peking, Yudin, presented the proposal to the Chinese leadership, Mao shouted, How dare you suggest such a thing? This proposal is an insult to our national pride and our sovereignty. Yudin sent an alarming telegram to the Central Committee describing Mao's reaction. We had a discussion in the leadership and decided that I should fly to China at the behest of the Presidium of the Central Committee. Because we were going to be discussing military affairs, I was accompanied by Malinovsky and also by Kuznetsov. Ours was to be a secret visit. We traveled incognito. We asked the Chinese comrades to receive us, and they agreed. We were met at the airport by Mao, Chen Yi, and someone else. They set us up in a residence somewhere in Peking, while well, most of the time we spent beside a swimming pool with some shade next to it. Of course, I couldn't compete with Mao in the pool. As everyone knows, he's since set a world record for both speed and distance. I'm a poor swimmer, and was perfectly willing to take my hat off to Mao when it comes to swimming. However, the subject at hand had nothing to do with swimming. We lay there sunning ourselves on our towels like seals on the warm sand. We had informal discussions on political matters. Most of the subjects that we'd talked about, and we'd requested, but I apologized to Mao, saying that we in no way intended to violate China's sovereignty, interfere in its internal affairs, impose upon its economy, or damage its national pride. Mao replied by making a counterproposal. Give us the necessary credits, and we'll build the radio station ourselves. Fine, I said. That's a good solution. We'll send you the blueprints, the equipment, the technical advisors, and we'll loan you the money you need. All right, said Mao. We agree. So much for that problem. But there was something else. Our Navy wanted to refuel our submarines to give our crews shore leave at the ports along the Chinese coast. When I put this idea to Mao, once again he became adamant. He rejected the sixth suggestion out of hand. Comrade Mao, I said, we can't understand you at all. It would serve your interests as well as ours for us to be able to use your ports. I won't hear of it, he replied. We're building a submarine fleet of our own, and it would constitute an encroachment upon our sovereignty if Soviet submarines had access to our ports. 
well, maybe you'd agree to a reciprocal agreement by which you could have submarine bases in the Arctic Ocean along the Soviet coast in exchange for our rights to your Pacific ports. No, said Mao. We won't agree to that either. Every country should keep its armed forces on its own territory, and no one else's. All right, we won't insist. We'll make do with the facilities we already have at our disposal. We'll base our Pacific submarine fleet in our own Far Eastern ports. I couldn't object too strenuously to Mao's reaction. Perhaps we'd been a bit hasty in suggesting that he give us a submarine base for China. He obviously suspected of us to try to get a hold, a foothold for further encroachments. In general, I'm against asking a country to relinquish its sovereignty over any of its territory, unless there is a concrete danger of war, and even then, I think countries should yield their sovereignty only on a reciprocal basis. As for the radio station, nothing ever came of it either. The Chinese reneged on their agreement and didn't build the station. Later, we started launching satellites, which are better for maintaining radio contact with submarines anyway. Despite Mao's occasional abrasive outbursts, our conversations in general were conducted in a calm, friendly tone. However, he expressed some perplexing views on the possibility of another war. From what he'd said in Moscow a year earlier, I was already familiar with some of his ideas, but during our talks around the swimming pool in Peking, he went further than I'd ever heard him go before. Let's try to imagine a future war, he began. He sounded just like Stalin, who also loved to raise hypothetical questions of that sort. How many divisions does the United States have? We know the population of the United States, so we can figure out how many divisions the Americans could raise if they conscripted their able-bodied men. Then he went down the list of the other capitalist countries, England, France, and so on. Now, he continued, how many divisions can we raise? Consider the population of China, of the Soviet Union, and the other socialist countries, and you'll see what I mean. He was smiling at me as though to say, see how the balance of power is in our favor? I was too appalled and embarrassed by his line of thinking even to argue with him. To me, his words sounded like baby talk. How is it possible for a man like this to think such things? For that matter, how is it possible for him to have risen to such an important post? Comrade Mao, I said, you're making a fundamental error in your calculations. You realize things have changed since the time of Suvorov. Modern soldiers no longer live by the motto, a bullet is a fool, but a bayonet is a sure friend. Battles are no longer won with bayonets, or bullets either, for that matter. Even Suvorov used to say that a better trained and better armed force can defeat an enemy that outnumbers it. In his day, arms meant swords and cannon. With the invention of the machine gun, the nature of warfare changed. A few machine gunners could mow down huge numbers of infantrymen like a farmer with a Sith. Now, in the age of missiles and nuclear bombs, the number of divisions on one side or the other has practically no effect on the outcome of a battle. A hydrogen bomb can turn whole divisions into so much cooked meat. One bomb has an enormous radius of destruction. Mao's only reply was that he'd grown up as a guerrilla warrior. He, used to, he was used to battles in which rifles and bayonets, more than machine guns, to say nothing of bombs, played the key role. He was the leader of such a great country as China, but he expressed opinions and made grandiose claims that were hopelessly outdated. Later, when I informed our leadership about my conversation with Mao, everyone was perplexed. No one supported Mao's point of view. We couldn't understand how our ally, a man who we've already sensed had aspirations to be the leader of the world communist movement, could have such a childish outlook on the problem of war. Mao had given us a lot of food for thought. Now, before we go over to the next reading, uh, I wanted to break here and... Uh, Thanks to Todd, uh, one of my listeners, uh, who made a comment on Facebook that I found very interesting about Khrushchev's naivete when he made the suggestion to China about uh, putting these submarine bases and, and kind of using their land. Uh, one has to remember that China had come out of a period of uh, imperialistic rule over them. So many countries cut them apart, like Britain and France. Uh, 
you know, and using their territories in Japan. They were very paranoid at this time about anybody else encroaching on their sovereignty. So I think it was rather unusual and very naive when you listen to what Khrushchev has to say about it. And I want to thank Todd, you know, for bringing that up and having a really nice explanation of it on Facebook. So remember just to join the Facebook uh, group at Russian Rulers History Podcast, and you'll be able to share a lot of this information or read a lot of this because quite a number of the uh, listeners are chiming in with some really great insight. And now we're going to go over to the uh, Formosa Strait Crisis. Despite their reluctance to let us use their ports for our submarines, the Chinese in 1958 requested considerable military aid from us. They said they wanted it in order to stage a military operation against Chiang Kai-shek. They asked for aircraft, long-range artillery, and Air Force advisors. We gave them what they asked for in the belief that they were planning a decisive action to liquidate Chiang Kai-shek. We made no move to try to restrain our Chinese comrades because we thought they were absolutely right in trying to unify all the territories of China. However, when we offered to station our interceptor squadrons on their territory, they reacted in an extremely odd way. They made it clear that our offer had offended them. I couldn't understand why. We weren't trying to force ourselves on them. We weren't pursuing any goals except for our fraternal solidarity in the cause of strengthening the borders of China, incorporating Taiwan into the Chinese People's Republic, destroying the regime of Chiang Kai-shek, and uniting all Chinese people in one republic. The Chinese operation against Chiang Kai-shek took the form of shelling of two small offshore islands. We were all in favor of Mao Zedong's liquidating these two islands as potential jumping-off points for a landing assault on the mainland by the forces of Chiang Kai-shek. At the time, Chiang dreamed of retaking the mainland, and we were informed that the Americans were egging him on. We considered it possible that the People's Republic of China might be attacked any day. At first it looked as though the Chinese had bitten off more than they could chew. The Americans began actively supporting Chang, and Mao's forces were bogged down in a lengthy artillery duel. You can imagine our surprise when the balance tipped in favor of Mao Zedong and the People's Republic of China. Mao's forces devastated both islands and liberated one of them, forcing Chiang Kai-shek to evacuate his soldiers. However, just when the Chinese were in a position to cross the strait and occupy the islands, they suddenly halted their offensive. As a result, the whole operation came to nothing. We were very perplexed, and when Chao Enlai came to see us, we asked him about what had happened. Later, we also brought the subject up with Mao himself. Comrade Mao! Why did you stop just when you were in the reach of victory? We knew it, what we were doing. What do you mean you knew you, what you were doing? You started the operation in the first place in order to seize the islands, and you stopped just short of your objective. What did that prove? Are you now trying to tell me you never intended to go through with your plan? All we wanted to do was show our potential. We don't want Chang to be too far away from us. We want to keep him within our reach. Having him on Kuimoi and Matsu means we can get at him with our shore batteries as well as our air force. If we'd occupied the islands, we would have lost the ability to cause him any discomfort any time we wanted. That seemed like a strange explanation. By allowing Chang to keep his forces on Kuimoi and Matsu, Mao was also keeping himself open to an enemy invasion any day. Now we move on to the third visit to Peking. Later, when I give my account of the Sino-Indian War, I will relate how Mao tried to dictate to the Soviet Union a foreign policy which contradicted the correct Marxist-Leninist position we held at the time. He started the war out of some sick fantasy and out of a desire to draw us and the other socialist countries into the conflict so that he could exert his will on us. I have to admit I wasn't at all enthusiastic about flying to Peking when hostilities broke out between China and India in 1959. I knew my official welcome would be laid on according to form, but I didn't expect to be greeted with the same fraternal goodwill I'd encountered in 1954 on my first trip to Peking. The warmth had gone out of our relations with China and had been replaced by a chill 
I could sense as soon as I arrived. I was prepared for the change in atmosphere because I'd been following what the Chinese press was saying about us. And the Chinese were treating the Soviet specialists, scientists, doctors, engineers, and advisors we'd sent to help build the new plants and other enterprises or loans made possible. The Chinese did everything to discredit our people there. Rather than thanking us for our help, they resented the presence of our experts in China and complained about the machinery we'd given them. In other words, they smeared everything Soviet. Meanwhile, Chinese students in the USSR started spreading anti-Soviet leaflets in our schools. Later, they organized anti-Soviet demonstrations in our streets and squares. They even staged demonstrations in our trains while traveling from our country to China. I remember one incident in particular. It took place at a railroad station near Mongolia. There are no decent words to describe what, a Chinese, what the Chinese students did. They took down their pants and made a mess on the platform, right there in the railroad station. They were supposed to be cultured people, yet they were nothing but swine. They couldn't use the excuse that they didn't know better. They knew perfectly well what they were doing, although the devil alone knows what they thought they were proving. There was no way to look the other way and ignore such incidents. After a while, relations became so heated that we had to send home Chinese students who were misbehaving. Back in China, the conditions in which our advisors were living became simply intolerable. Gangs of drunken Chinese started abusing them. They called us limiters. We knew this term only too well. It had been a common insult during a certain stage of our own development. But there was no excuse for the Chinese to be repeating our own stupid mistakes. Our engineers in China began informing us about incredible events. They would go back to their apartments or hotels at the end of the day and find their suitcases turned upside down and their rooms ransacked. These were not isolated incidents either. They were frequent occurrences. Who knows what the Chinese thought they would find by searching our workers' rooms? Anti-Chinese literature, perhaps? The idea of printing such stuff never occurred to us. There was no such thing as anti-Chinese literature in the Soviet Union. So that was the thanks we got for building whole plants for the Chinese and giving them credits at 2 to 2.5% two interest, which is about a third the interest rate in the capitalist world. That was the thanks we got for sending our top specialists to help them develop their industry. Finally, we were confronted with the question, what was to be done? We couldn't simply stand by allowing some of our best qualified specialists, people who had been trained in our own agriculture and industry, to receive nothing but harassment in exchange for their help. Finally, we had no choice but to recall our advisors from China. Once we brought them home, the Chinese started smearing us behind our backs in their conversations with communists from other countries, saying we'd withdrawn our assistance for no reason. They played this game of slander with a skill which only the Chinese are capable of. I hope people who read my memoirs will understand that when I say the Chinese here, I don't mean the Chinese people, who are on the whole friendly and hardworking, nor do I mean the rank and file of the Chinese Communist Party. Instead, I'm talking about Mao Zedong and his colleagues, who are engaged in a broad campaign to throw mud on the Soviet leadership, the Soviet state, and the whole Soviet system. In addition to discrediting us, the Chinese also started mistreating our comrades from other countries. I'm thinking in particular about the conflicts between China and North Vietnam which led the Chinese to recall their experts and workers from Vietnam. On a wider front, Mao's conduct during the Sino-Indian conflict was just one example of a systematic campaign to torpedo and subvert our efforts at promoting peaceful coexistence. At party conferences, the Chinese did everything to undermine our position and succeeded in stirring up trouble for the representatives of those countries which supported the fight for peace. For every proposal of ours, Mao and the people around him came up with a counter-proposal. They argued that working for peace through international organizations violated true Leninist principles, that it led to pacifism, that it weakened and disarmed the revolutionary instinct in people. They believed that in order to replace capitalism with socialism, the peoples of the world must engage in a more active revolutionary struggle. Fortunately, the movement for peaceful coexistence went on, despite China's attempt to turn world opinion against us. Now for 
The Great Leap Forward. I'm the first to admit that the Chinese had huge obstacles to overcome in developing their economy, and that for a while they seemed to be making impressive progress. Lenin used to say that the collectivization of agriculture should be conducted on the basis of mechanization, and if you give the peasants enough tractors, they'll willingly submit to collectivization. Well, the Chinese not only didn't have enough tractors, they didn't even have enough wooden plows. As a result, they pooled their meager means of production so as to consolidate their labor. We were pleased to observe their success. I remember when we toured China, we used to laugh at their primitive forms of organization. At an earthworks, for instance, some manual laborers would stand in a single file and pass baskets of dirt from one man to the next. Others carried baskets on their shoulders. They looked like a human conveyor belt. Some wit in our delegation said for the first time in his life he'd seen a Chinese walking steam shovel. Our Chinese comrades liked a good joke, so we told them this one at the dinner table. They roared with laughter. If they were offended, they didn't let on. The Chinese know how to wear a mask which conceals their true feelings. For a while it looked as though Mao might succeed in showing the world a Chinese economic miracle. If, for example, you compared China to India, you'd see that while India has a broader industrial base, China's, China's standard of living was improving faster. We were full of pride and wonder at what our Chinese comrades were accomplishing. However, just as China seemed about to perfect an exemplary socialist system, Mao began abusing his power. He ruined the economy, all the name of the so-called Great Leap Forward. The Chinese are good at inventing catchy phrases. The Great Leap Forward came after the Hundred Flowers campaign. Part and parcel of the Great Leap Forward was another slogan. Catch up with England in five years, America in a little bit longer. When we read that, we couldn't believe our eyes. Of course, it doesn't hurt for the leadership to spur its people on toward technological and economic process, progress, but the idea of overtaking the most advanced capitalist countries in such a short time was ridiculous. We too wanted to catch up with the United States. We weren't yet at a stage where we could afford to set a definitive di deadline, though the, we were sometimes tempted. It was obvious what Mao was up to. He thought that if he could match England and then catch the U.S. by the tail in five years, he would be able to outdistance the party of Lenin and surpass the strides Soviet people had made since the October Revolution. What happened? Well, when China made its great leap forward, it landed in a lot of trouble. The economy actually fell backward in a number of different ways at once. Mao broke up China's collective farms and created communes in their place. He communized the peasants together with all their personal belongings. This was absurd. Collectivization of means of production is one thing, but communization of personal belongings is quite another, and it's sure to lead to undesirable consequences. After a while, communes were converted into military settlements. As a result, Chinese agriculture, which had been coming along so promisingly, suddenly suffered a severe setback, and famine broke out in the countryside. Industry, too, was wrecked. The Chinese began expecting raw material, experiencing raw material shortages, and their factory equipment was badly damaged, largely because they started saying that the rated capacity for machinery was a bourgeois notion. They bragged, for example, that they could get more production out of a machine purchased from the Soviet Union than the manufacturer's manual re recommended. As a result, the lifespan of their machinery was severely impaired. Engineers who had technical expertise were denounced as bourgeois sycophants or subversives and reassigned to menial jobs. Chinese industry became disorganized. In fact, their whole economy was degenerating into anarchy. We began to read about how the Chinese were building a backyard steel industry with miniature blast furnaces behind people's houses. We couldn't help wondering about the quality and cost of pig iron produced in this manner. The technology of these backyard furnaces was extremely primitive. The Chinese were reverting to a method which hadn't been used for hundreds of years. It was like an epidemic. Collectives and even individual families were supposed to erect their own blast furnaces. I was even told by someone just back from China that Sun Yat-sen's widow had one. I don't know whether she ever produced any pig iron from her furnace, but she showed it off and bragged about it to visitors. 
Chow Wen Lai had been keeping us posted about the latest developments in Chinese industry and agriculture. We always eagerly awaited his trips to Moscow and received him with pleasure. After the beginning of the Great Leap Forward, our embassy in Peking relayed to us word from Comrade Chow that he was coming to Moscow and wanted to see us. We answered straight away that we'd be glad to hear what he had to say. Comrade Chow flew in and came for talks with us. He said that the Chinese steel industry was in a bad way and asked us to send our experts to help sort things out. We need more qualified specialists than your advisors presently in China. We need someone who can tell us what we're doing wrong and what we ought to be doing instead. After discussing the problem in our leadership, we decided to send Comrade Zadyako, who was then a Deputy Prime Minister and Deputy Chairman of the State Planning Commission. I knew him well from the time when we'd been the head of the largest coal mine in the Stalino region. Comrade Zadyako had only one drawback, and it was to be his undoing. He couldn't control his drinking. Nevertheless, we sent him to China. Undoubtedly, he took a supply of vodka with him on the train. After a few weeks, he returned and reported to me. What's the situation there, comrade? I asked. What advice did you have to offer our Chinese brothers? He never minced words. He came straight to the point. All I can tell you, comrade Khrushchev, is that they've got no one but themselves to blame for their problems. I inspected one of their steel plants. They've let the whole thing go to pot. Their open hearth furnaces, blast furnaces, rolling mills, everything's in a shambles. When I asked to meet the manager of the plant, he turned out to be a veterinarian. I asked Chow and Lai, Comrade Chow, where are all the steel engineers whom we trained in the USSR and who graduated from our schools? He told me they're working in the countryside, forging their proletarian consciousnesses. While well, people like the veterinarian who don't know the first thing about metallurgy are trying to run the steel mills. I could tell that Chow himself thought the whole thing was pretty stupid, and there wasn't anything he could do about it. The Great Leap Forward wasn't his idea. No, the Great Leap Forward was the invention of Mao Zedong and no one else. He wanted to show that there could be a special Chinese method for building socialism. He wanted to impress the world, especially the socialist world. He wanted to impress the uh, world around him with his genius and his leadership. For anyone who's interested in learning more about the Great Leap Forward after reading my memoirs, I recommend the report I gave at the 21st Congress of the CPSU. That document contains a fairly hard-hitting and, I believe, accurate analysis of what was going on in China at that time, although I didn't refer to China by name. We made it clear that our attitude toward the Great Leap Forward was negative. So this next part is really at uh, the heart of the Sino-Soviet conflict of the uh, 60s and 70s, and it's about the border. For years, Mao Zedong has been spoiling for a fight. He's been looking for an opportunity to take control of the international communist movement, and he knows that in order to do so, he must challenge the Soviet Union. It doesn't matter what Soviet leader he picks a fight with, Khrushchev or Petrov or Ivanov or Sudarnov. Since I retired, Mao has intensified his struggle, aggravating tensions to the point where they might explode into military conflict any day. I've seen reports recently that the Chinese are taking certain defensive measures, such as digging trenches and building bomb shelters. The Chinese leadership has dragged the split out into the open by appealing to the masses to prepare for war. For some time now, the work going on in Chinese defense research institutes and design bureaus has seemed to be directed against us. During the years when I held a high post in the government and the party, I saw the buildup of the tendencies that are now coming to a head. I was put on my guard against Mao's chauvinism as early as 1954 when I first went to Peking. Despite his exceptionally cordial manner, I could sense an undercurrent of nationalism in his praise of the Chinese nation. His words reflected his belief in the superiority of the Chinese race, an idea which is completely contrary to the communist view of the world. All nations are equal. Individuals should be distinguished not by their nationality, but by their class affiliation. We had to sit through Mao's long-winded lectures on the history of China, in which he told us about all the conquerors, 
Genghis Khan and the rest, who tried to impose their rule on China and ended up being absorbed by the Chinese instead. Mao kept stressing the claim that the Chinese people are immune to the assimilation by other peoples. He loved to tell us how the Chinese are the greatest people in the world, how they have had a superior culture since prehistoric times, and how they have a unique role to play in history. When we returned to Moscow after our trip, we exchanged opinions and impressions within the leadership, at closed meetings, naturally. In my capacity as the head of our delegation, I pointed out to my comrades that Mao's tendency to equate himself with the Chinese people as a whole and his air of superiority towards other nationalities boded ill for the future. As I predicted, it later became apparent that Mao's egotism got the better of him, and he refused to accept an equal partnership in the collective leadership of the international communist movement. He wanted others to acknowledge his hegemony. Mao's chauvinism and arrogance was especially manifest in the territorial claims which the Chinese had made against the Soviet Union. After Stalin's death, we not only liquidated the joint companies formed for the exploitation of the natural resources in Xinjiang, we gave up all our interests there. We liquidated all unequal treaties and arranged for the return of Port Arthur to China and the evacuation of our troops. Any delays in those negotiations were caused by the Chinese side not ours. Later we were informed that certain, certain bourgeois newspapers in China were complaining that the Chinese people weren't satisfied with the Sino-Soviet border, especially around Vladivostok. According to this line of argument, the Russian czars had imposed the far eastern frontier on the Chinese. As far as we were concerned, we weren't responsible for what our czars had done, but the lands gained from the czarist treaties were now Soviet territory. We weren't the only socialist country which had to administer and defend the territory inherited from a pre-revolutionary regime. We were afraid if we started remapping our frontiers according to historical considerations, the situation could get out of hand and lead to conflict. Besides, a true communist and internationalist wouldn't assign any particular importance to the question of borders, especially borders f between fellow socialist states. National borders should pale into significance in the light of the Marxist-Leninist philosophy, which holds that international revolutionary movement, a force that transcends national boundaries, will triumph everywhere in the end. We communicated these reactions to the Chinese and let them know we were concerned about the unfriendly articles which had been appearing in the Hong Kong press. They replied that we shouldn't pay attention to what bourgeois newspapers wrote, they said those newspapers were simply reflecting the sentiments of the hostile classes, and not the sentiments of the leadership. We contented ourselves with this explanation, although we asked the Chinese comrades to issue a statement publicly clarifying their views on the border issue. They refused, and we didn't insist. We decided to take their word. Then, in the question of Mongolia came up. I think it was when we were in China for a joint conference of our two parties. The Chinese delegation was headed by Mao Zedong, but the matter of the Mongolian-Chinese border was raised by Chao Enlai, though of course we knew that Chao's words reflected Mao's thoughts. Chao handled the question very diplomatically. What would you think if Mongolia became part of the Chinese state, he began. You're raising a matter which is difficult for us to comment on, I replied. This is an issue which concerns Mongolia and China. We have nothing to do with it. We're a third party. Don't you think you should address yourselves to the Mongolians? I believe the Chinese had expected me to answer that way. Chao was ready with his next question. Fair enough. But well, we'd like to know in advance what your reaction would be if Mongolia did become part of China. Our attitude would depend on the attitude of the Mongolian comrades. But I can give you my personal opinion. I very much doubt that Mongolians will welcome your suggestion. Besides, Mongolia is about to become a member of the United Nations and has recently established diplomatic relations with a number of states. The Mongolians would certainly lose that recognition if they were absorbed into China. However, I certainly don't want to speak for the Mongolian leaders. That's all we heard or said on the subject, but I know the Mongolians were anxious to define their border with China more clearly. It's a complicated problem because Mongolia is divided into two parts. The People's Republic of Mongolia, which is independent, and so-called Inner Mongolia, which is inside China. 
It's almost impossible to use ethnological or historical criteria to divide the two, since no matter how you slice Mongolia, you can't help, so to speak, cutting into the body of the Mongolian people. Therefore, the Mongolians began reviewing the problem themselves. They told us they were exchanging maps with the Chinese and conducting negotiations. Finally, they arrived at a mutually expedient agreement and established a border satisfactory to both sides. We would have liked to have done the same thing with the Chinese, but our relations deteriorated. The Chinese began to pursue two lines of attack in their propaganda about our borders. First, they dragged out the old question about how the Soviet Union had seized the Baltic states and then annexed certain territories from Romania and Poland, territories which, by the way, had belonged to Russia before World War I. In the words of their treacherous radio station, the Chinese accused us of following a czarist policy of conquest. I won't even bother to reply to such charges. I think that the Soviet government had issued enough statements through TASS and the press. If we were to renounce the lands we inherited from the bourgeois government of the czars, we'd find ourselves in a hopeless tangle of historical confusion and political quarrels. For example, what should we do with those nationality groups who migrated from their countries of origin in the not-too-distant past and now have their own lands? Should we drive them out and make them go live on the moon? To my way of thinking, the whole theory of historical borders is nonsense. It's a dead issue, one which our enemies try to revive when they want to stir up trouble or conduct an aggressive policy against the Soviet Union and other socialist countries. I think it's shameful for China to be using such tactics as they were when I was in leadership, and still are today. In addition to making accusations about how we'd incorporated certain lands in Europe, the Chinese started up again with hostile statements about how we'd seized territory from them in the Far East. We wanted to put a stop to such talk once and for all. To do so, we had to reach an agreement with China and redraw our boundaries. One complication here is that since the time of the Tsarist Treaty with China, the riverbeds of the Amur and Usuri rivers had shifted somewhat, forming new islands. According to the old treaty, the border followed the river bank on the Chinese side, so the islands technically belonged to the USSR. Nevertheless, we were willing to recognize the interests of the Chinese population living along the border, and we allowed the local herders to graze their sheep and cattle and collect far firewood on territory which was not, strictly speaking, part of China. In short, we adopted a friendly and considerate attitude toward the needs of the Chinese state. Our border guards served a primarily symbolic function and were lenient about border violations committed by the other side. In certain designated areas, we made no demands on the Chinese and no protests against them. But soon the Chinese began firing at our patrol boats on the river. When I say the Chinese, I don't mean soldiers in uniform, but our border guards reported that they'd just seen Chinese troops to disguised as peasants. A number of fist fights broke out between Chinese and Soviet guards, but our own men were under strict orders not to let themselves be provoked into armed conflict. Usually the scuffles went no further than pushing and shoving, with the guards tearing off each other's buttons. Rather than let these clashes get worse until they led to a skirmish, which would do neither side any good, we put together a governmental committee and appealed to the Chinese for talks. After a long back and forth of messages, the Chinese finally agreed to a meeting. We'd offered to let them choose the site. They said they wanted to talk on their territory, territory, and we agreed. At the beginning of the negotiations, both sides presented their claims orally. The Chinese stated that they had a right to Vladivostok and a substantial area in Soviet Central Asia. There was no way we'd entertain such claims. After all, the Soviet Far East wasn't even populated by Chinese. Nor was Central Asia. The population in the Far East considered mostly of Russians, while in Central Asia it was made up of Kazakhs, Tadziks, Urkhois, and Kyrgyzes. An especially troublesome point was the status of the Pamir Mountains, which weren't included in any treaty between the Soviet and Chinese governments. We instructed our delegation to explain to the Chinese that the Pamirs were populated by the Tadziks and that therefore the mountains were quite reasonably part of the Tadzik Republic. In the second stage of our talks, both sides presented maps outlining their claims. When the Chinese handed us their map, we saw that they no longer claimed Vladivostok or Central Asia, but they did claim those islands in the border rivers that were closer to Chinese than so the Soviet side. 
They proposed that we redraw the boundary. Instead of running along the Chinese bank, it would run down the middle of the river. This proposal was in keeping with international practice, so we agreed, even though it meant relinquishing control of most of the islands. Thus, we resolved the disputes between us, at least in principle. However, one issue remained unresolved. The Chinese demanded navigation rights along the Amur River that would have allowed them to come literally right up to the walls of Khabarovsk. We insisted that they stick to an old treaty signed between Russia and China, which restricted Chinese shipping to the so-called Kazakevich Channel. On that matter, we reached an impasse. When it finally came time to sign a limited agreement setting new borders, we were willing to give a little as well as take a little. Plus, some territory here, minus some there. That's what we proposed. As for the disputed areas, just divide them in half. In other words, we were ready to take a ruler and draw a line through the middle. That was a wise decision. It would have met concessions on both sides. We simply wanted to find a mutually acceptable solution which would damage neither the prestige nor the material well-being either of China or the Soviet Union. Don't tease the geese, as we Russians like to say. Why make trouble? The rectification and the redrawing of the borders was simply a matter of good sense. After all, borders don't exist for the good of birds who can fly anywhere they want. Borders must be accessible to frontier guards who are responsible for protecting the security of the country. But what seemed conciliatory and sensible to us wasn't good enough for the Chinese. When our representatives returned to China for the final round of negotiations, the Chinese wouldn't accept our position. Even though they had given up their claims to Vladivostok and more than half of Central Asia, they wanted us to acknowledge that the existing borders were based on illegal and unequal treaties, which the Tsars had forced upon a weak Chinese government. They wanted our new treaty to include a clause specifying that the new borders perpetuated an injustice foisted on China over a hundred years ago. How could any sovereign state sign such a document? If we'd signed it, we would have tacitly acknowledging that the injustices must be rectified. In other words, that we would have to go to renounce our claim to the territories in question. We were back to square one. The talks were broken off, and our delegation came home. To this day, the inequality clause has stuck in our throats. The next round of negotiations was to take place in the USSR. We discussed the matter in the government and issued the appropriate instructions to our delegation, which was headed by Gernalov. He was a calm, sensible, highly competent man who was well suited to dealings with the Chinese. However, the Chinese never replied to our last initiatives, and the talks were never resumed while I was in the leadership. Since the end of my political career, I followed the Sino-Soviet border dispute in the newspapers, and I gather our government's position hasn't changed. In fact, I think today the Soviet Union is pursuing the same policies which were conducted when I was head of the government and the party. Well, I hope you enjoyed that reading. It's a little longer than usual podcast. Uh, now, don't forget to join us at Russian Rulers History Podcast on Facebook, where you can join in on all the great discussions or just read them, because there are some excellent things coming out. Uh, we had a discussion also of the uh, latest uh, the uh, sentencing of the girls from a pussy riot in Moscow by the Putin government, and that was a lively discussion. So please come by where you can ask a question, leave a comment, or make a suggestion. But as always, das vidanya i spasiba bolshoya.